Hello and thank you for joining today's State of Robotics webinar, presented by Digital Dream Labs. We are joined today by DDL's Chief Executive Officer, Jacob Hantar, and Director of Customer Experience, Robbie Bassard. Hello, and how are you both doing today? Hey, Butter Robot, I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. That's great to hear. Before we get started, here are a few housekeeping tips to help you get the most out of today's webinar. All attendees will be muted throughout the presentation. We ask that you use the Q&A feature to relay any questions. Team members will try to answer your question via chat and we will also have a live question slash answer session at the conclusion of the webinar. Digital Dream Labs will be sharing a recording of the presentation. Finally, please take a moment at the end of the webinar to complete a brief five-question survey. This will help us improve the webinar and better service robotics community. And now I will turn it over to Digital Dream Lab CMO, Matt Eversoul. Matt, what is your purpose? My purpose is to pass butter. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we've got a packed uh, presentation for you. Uh, Robbie, Jacob, thank you for making some time um, for the presentation as well. Uh, our webinar agenda today, as you can see, we'll be starting off with Vector, uh, then moving into Cosmo Butter Robot, Overdrive, and then finishing with a live question and answer session. Uh, as Butter Robot mentioned, we will have team members answering questions live throughout the presentation. And we also have quite a few questions that uh, attendees gave us when they registered that we'll be covering as well. Uh, so with no further ado, Robbie, why don't we take it away and start talking about Vector and Vector 2.0. Hey, thanks, Matt. Appreciate the uh, the intro there. Um, so there's quite a bit going, on, uh, going around with Vector right at the moment. Um, so uh, on the Oscar side, which is kind of my side of the house at the moment here, uh, we've been working on uh, quite a bit. So uh, previously, you'd seen the animation assets for Oscar being released uh, for Vector, and that allows you to really easily uh, modify uh, animations and the eyes, like the procedurally generated eyes. One example I have, I actually loaded my development robot with uh, with these. Um, so you can modify the eyes, and here I've just modified basically the size of the eyes but you can do tons of different things. You can modify just about everything of the, uh, you know, every piece of the eyes, uh, you know, how much they're highlighted, uh, you know, the specific, you know, hue and saturation, all of this kind of stuff you can modify uh, with the robot and customize to your exact liking. And um, so there's tons of ways that you can, um, you can have fun with that. We've also included some Python scripts that you can really easily get started with. And the documentation on that is, is pretty, you know, front to back. So I hope everyone is enjoying those, but we've also uh, just this week, we, we released the audio assets for Vector as well, including both the raw and remixed forms. So if you ever wanted to see kind of uh, how, uh, you know, Anki previously had designed some of these sounds to match Vector's personality, even before they had had done a whole lot of the, the remixing inside of the audio engine. Uh, that's one way to do that. And um, I'll throw in links to some of our GitHub uh, repositories where you can find some of these files, play them back for yourself, kind of check it out. And then, uh, you know, if you have the tools and the, um, you know, and the expertise, you can start modifying your um, sounds on Vector as well. So there's a ton of uh, stuff being happen, uh, you know, happening on the Oscar side. We're also going to be coming out with, uh, we're going to be looking at some different utilities that that Anki had used and that we're going to carry forward um, to make uh, you know customization and modification of the robots a little bit easier, as well as some of the development documentation and some of the the uh, coding philosophies that they had followed uh, that you know that will be kind of carrying forward and um, kind of the best practices for uh, for working with the robots. So those are the two kind of next pieces that we expect to release. And there's a couple, uh, there's quite a, well, not a couple, there's quite a few uh, items coming more after that, but those are going to be long-term projects. We're starting to get into like the bigger engines of Vector and uh, there's some massive, massive projects around that. So, um, you know, keep those in mind. Uh, we are continuing efforts to increase and unify the support documentation. Uh, that's also, you know, part of my, um, 
uh, you know, part of my wheelhouse is making sure that we have a good user experience through ensuring that we have um, the proper documentation out there, that it's very clear, it steps, you know, through exactly what the user expects to see, and then, um, you know, handles any use cases that kind of fall outside of that. So that's, um, a, again, a major uh, concentration of my teams, and uh, those that's going to be uh, pretty, you know, pretty, a pretty significant effort going forward. Um, and uh, that's kind of what I'm working on here on my side. Um, we're also considering expanding documentation into other formats and looking at different ways to get information across, especially with some of the more frequently asked questions. So keep an eye out for, um, you know, for some new developments on that end, but um, I can't release too many details here. But I think uh, you know, there's some projects in, in the works there that I expect will be a lot of fun. Um, cool. And Matt, yeah, take it away with the poll there. Yeah, great. And so talking about expanded support topics, uh, we do have a question that we want to ask attendees. And that is, what topics would you like to see more documentation for? And, and the topics we've included in the, the survey here is how to and why you should clean vector, tips and tricks for better facial recognition, tips for planning your vector's habitat, how vector security works, and tips and tricks for better voice recognition. So if you could just take a moment to select which ones do you think uh, should be our top priority, I suppose. And then, I, I, Robbie, I, I think if, if we have uh, any attendees that have other questions that they think might be great topics, please feel free to share those in the, uh, the Q&A box and maybe the team can consider those for uh, future application. All right, great. It looks like we're closing in on three quarters of you having voted now. Uh, if you could just get those last couple of votes in and we will be sharing the results. Okay, Robbie, yeah, it looks like the topic how to and why you should clean vector is a uh, narrow winner here, uh, but quickly followed by tips and tricks for better voice recognition. What do you think? That is a good start. I think, um that's kind of where we had started to look at so that doc, that extra documentation coming out. Um, and I think that that is kind of fits perfectly with what we had anticipated. So we'll definitely get some more tips and tricks on cleaning your vector, as well as, um, you know, planning the vector habitat and uh, tips for better voice recognition. So those 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 three will we'll definitely focus on first. Okay, great. And then if we can bring Jacob back in, and if Jacob uh, you're with a lot of the team members here at the office today. Um, and next thing we wanted to talk about is really the work that we're doing for uh, the repair center there and how we're gearing up to support uh, the current uh, Gen 1 Vector and Cosmo uh, in the repair center. Yep. You want to go ahead and have my video go on? You're good. All right. Okay, cool. Thanks. Well, I don't know about you guys. But thank you for joining. Uh, I am tired of the talking heads and PowerPoint presentations. It's time to take a look at what actually goes on inside here and where real work is getting done. So I'm going to go over here to the repair part of our building, if you will. And I'll, I'm going to show you guys, this is where the setup is to test not only the new vectors that are coming out, for purposes of Q&A. And one thing I want to make clear is that we have pulled all in engineering and development prototyping into our space. So the, the, we have 100% control over all testing, electric, development, I mean, you name it. We have it all in-house now. The reason we did this is because the back and forth with Taiwan is just slowing us down way too much. Something that would take should take only a day uh, has been taking a week or two weeks. So everything we're doing here is all related to the final output and production of Vector. And once we have that, we are then sending it to the manufacturer as turnkey solutions. So that's one of the major reasons 
we can't, everyone in the office is vaccinated. We want to go to Taiwan and work shoulder to shoulder with the engineers. Unfortunately, we're just blocked. They won't even let you in, even with the quarantine. They, they blocked us. So that's what we're doing to overcome this. All development work, electronics, you name it, printed circuit boards happening here, and then everything's being sent to Taiwan. So we are in the final phases of QA, QC. We've done the EVT, we've done the DVT, and now we're, we're gearing up for production. Now, what does that mean in terms of timelines? Now, I know uh, everyone is anxious, myself included, of what is the timeline? I'm going to walk over here to another station. What does that mean in terms of timeline? And what does that mean in terms of, like, when am I getting my vector? Well, first of all, we're already, like, I want to make that clear that everyone understands that. And I don't want to set a new deadline because then the team gets comfortable. What I really like about being under the gun like this is the pressure's focusing it. So here we have some more designs going on. Say hi. <laughs> um, and, 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 and more engineering designs going on for future versions of Vector. Now the ones we have, we've, uh, we've solidified. Vector 2.0, uh, all the components are purchased. We purchased those months ago. So we're sitting on all of the components that are necessary. We are sitting on practically everything else. The tooling was done back in March um, and we've run several different portions of um, Let's, let's call it EVT and DVT. So we're, 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 we're in the home stretch, I'll put it that way. But I'm not going to give any updates because that will make the team comfortable. I want the team to start getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. So I'm gonna move over here real quick. To turn off my video so I don't make you guys sick. So here's, here's one of the layouts I wanna show kind of to illustrate what we're doing with our manufacturer. So this is the final assembly and can you share the video again? That yeah, I'm kind of well. using, using a video stick. So I'm, you know, I am by no means an expert in photography, what have But this is essentially the the final bench that we are laying everything out. We do the scripts. We tell the manufacturer these are the scripts, and this is how you put it together. So all that's laid out and finished. And then we have a lot of the the design work from the software perspective going on right here behind me. So that's kind of, that's that's the production side of things and that's how things are coming together here at Digital Dream Labs. So if you wanna go back to the presentation, because at this point, I'd rather show and not tell. We've been talking to you guys for a long time. It's time to get to see the inner workings of Digital Dream Labs and how serious we are about all this stuff. So. Yeah. yeah, here's our little here, here's a little pizza tracker. And Matt, go ahead and yeah, and, and tell them. I think, Jacob, the one thing that would be good for all the attendees to understand, and and, and as you've said, we're not going to be sharing a new delivery date today. But I, I think what would be great for everyone to understand is everything that we have overcome up until this point, and how we're building momentum towards uh, the production of the pre-orders. And also that, you know, the retail delivery dates have, are, are shifting as well. We're, you know, the, 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 they're still going to be getting their units in advance of anything that's going to be on store shelves. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I want to thank everybody for your confidence in us. Uh, we've had very few uh, refund requests. The majority of those have been saying, look, I need some money to buy X, Y, Z. So, Thank you for your support. And I look at this like our Kickstarter, right? We we ran behind on Oscar and we ran behind on Escape Pod, but we delivered. We performed on our promises and we're only going to continue to make those better. So we have the footing, we have the desire, we have we have the passion and you name it uh, to, to finish this goal. So um, yeah, I, I'm encouraged by everything we're seeing. And what I like about having all this stuff in house now, we have more control over our destiny. The way production was done before was spread in three different locations. And I like having everything in house. We can pick up and move and go wherever we need to we can go, wherever we need to go and do whatever we need to do to, to meet our goals. So um, yeah, um, um, 
I'll shut up and I'll let you keep talking. Well, now, so we, we have had a few questions uh, as it relates to uh, Vector and the, the production for Vector 2.0. So if Robbie, if you could join us back again, um, I, I think uh, the, the first uh, question I, I would like to ask is uh, whether or not third-party accessories uh, designed for Vector 1.0 robots uh, might be compatible with Vosmo, Vector, and Cosmo 2.0 units. Now, I, I don't believe we can make any, you know, we can't promise that products made by other companies are going to fit, but uh, Robbie, Jacob, any, any comments on those third-party accessories? Absolutely. So the body of Vector remains very much the same. Um, so the external surfaces and everything like that will be very, very similar to what they are currently and should make it easier on designers to, um, you know, to develop for the second iteration of these robots. Um, the Cosmo body will be very similar uh, in external uh, shape to the Vector body, um, if not directly identical. Um, this was done in an order to, number one, it, um, you know, it, it it does make uh, aftermarket parts easier to develop because you're effectively developing for one platform rather than two different, you know, entire different shapes uh, from an aftermarket uh, accessory perspective. So that will make it easier on folks like, um, you know, the companies like Designs by Dollar, whom we partnered with for the sticker detail, the exclusive decals, uh, to provide you with uh, quality aftermarket accessories uh, that you'll be able to order for your robots. Um, and then uh, now the previous generation of Cosmo. Uh, so for Vector, the, the old ones will fit the new ones. For Cosmo, uh, there will be new accessories needed for Cosmo 2.0, specifically because that body design is changing. Great, thank you. And then Absolutely. one other question, I think before we move on from uh, Vector, from, from the, the uh, attendees here, uh, and, and that's asking for a, perhaps an update on when we intend to release the uh, new firmware for Vector. That's a great question as well. So there is new firmware in development for Vector that is going to effectively allow the, um, you know, kind of these, these branches of hardware to merge, right? So our goal is to keep both hardware branches on the same firmware branch. This allows both robots, uh, Vector 1.0 and Vector 2.0, to effectively run the same firmware uh, with different checks for what hardware is actually running on the robot. Um, so this will effectively allow the new features that Vector 2.0 uh, will, um, you know, will will uh, be the new features that will be developed for Vector 2.0 uh, will likely also apply to Vector 1.0s as well. Um, not likely, it will, you know, they will apply up into the um, the hardware limitations, but we're nowhere near encountering those limitations at this time. Um, you know, a lot of the optimizations that were made for Vector 2.0 were for, uh, you know, user serviceability, uh, such as the batteries, and then for improved, fa uh, improved facial recognition and things like that. But um, I think that overall, we, you know, the, the spirit of this is we are continuing to support the Vector 1.0 robots. They're very relevant hardware, and um, they are going to be running the same uh, firmware and getting the same features as Vector 2.0. Great. And I think, Jacob, I want to ask you one question that we've had come in from uh, an attendee. And this question is, what does Digital Dream Labs mean when they say, and I'm going to put this in air quotes, lifetime subscription? Uh, how long is robots lifetime? And I think this is in reference to the lifetime subscription uh, vector subscription we're offering with vector pre-orders. That's a great I question mean, as well. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, did you, did no, you want to finish no, this one? No, go ahead, Robbie. Go for it, man. Okay. You're on a roll. All right. Yeah. So lifetime subscriptions, um, the normal expectation that a user has for electronics on today's consumer market is about two to three years on average. Um, we find that across multiple industries from mobile phones to, you know, robotic vacuums, things like that. Um, however, one thing that we're noticing is that, you know, these robots from 2018, with exception to things like batteries, um, and in some cases screens, is that they're, they're, they're still going very strong. The motors are very strong. The gearing is very strong. Um, and so those are going to continue, you know, those, those benefits are going to continue with the Vector 2.0s, but we're also adding in things like, um, you know, again, 
going kind of going back to the new batteries and the fact that those are going to be user serviceable. We're expecting to extend the life of that hardware significantly from uh, what it would have been, uh, you know, as kind of an average previously. So I, I mean, I hesitate to put out like a direct, you know, hey, here's how long we expect this hardware to last type thing. But um, I will say that most of the units still going very strong from, you know, the, the Vector 1.0 run. Um, and, you know, we expect that hardware uh, life lifespan to be pretty uh, stable. Um, we should see more than three years out of, um, out of those lifetime subscriptions. Now, lifetime subscriptions also are dependent upon the account, not specifically always just the robot. So um, if you pre, so for, for example, Kickstarters, if you pre-ordered uh, or, or if you, you know, were a Kickstarter and you have five licenses on your account, um, then in, in some specific cases, we may be able to transfer those from robot to robot as long as it stays under the same account. Um, but if those are non-transferable between users is the is the primary limitation there. Great. And then, of course, you know, some of the, the work that we're doing right now with the repair center will certainly extend uh, the lifetime of both uh, the current robots and uh, the second generation or Cosmo and Vector 2.0 robots. Robbie, one, one last question before we move on, and that's about Oscar. Um, and, and the attendee would like to know, uh, will you be able to use the open source kit for robots and escape pod for Vector 1.0? So um, the escape pod was originally designed for Vector 1.0, and that will carry over, the compatibility for those will carry over uh, for Vector 2.0. Um, as far as Oscar, yes, both of those products will be compatible with both iterations or, or generations of the robots. Okay, great, guys. I think that's most of the questions we've had uh, come in so far. But uh, please, any attendees, uh, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, we will get to those as uh, we have a live Q&A at the end of the webinar. Uh, for now, let's go ahead and move on to Cosmo and Cosmo 2.0. Robbie, what, what uh, updates are we looking at for the current version of the Cosmo app? Ah, yes, absolutely. So the Cosmo app, um, we are right now, we're making a lot of backend changes and rebranding changes to the application to make sure that it's, uh, you know, the development pipeline is very streamlined and it's ready for updating a little bit. Um, you know, it's going to be much easier to up, for us to update moving forward after this kind of large backend uh, systems transition. So that's, um, you know, we'll be able to, uh, you know, release, you know, more uh, updates and, you know, kind of uh, get more frequent after, you know, these manufacturing efforts are done. And a large part of this over, uh, you know, this back end overhaul is, is preparing and setting the stage for that. Okay, great. So, and then, okay, sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, just continue, Robbie, sorry. I was just going to say that um, I know that we are, you um, you know, we're working on this application and we're closing in. Uh, so we're hoping to have that out uh, very, you know, very soon uh, here shortly. So. Do, do we have any screenshots we could share of the progress? Because we're, we're, we're in the, we're almost done with it, right? Yeah. Um, Matt, I think, do you yeah. have that screenshot by chance? I don't have any screenshots available right now, but Jacob, we can maybe transition over to you. I know you've got a Cosmo prototype there with you in the office. And yeah. uh, while you're you know, showing that uh, to the attendees, maybe uh, Robbie or I can find the screenshot. Yeah, that'd yeah, be good. Me. I'd like people to take a look at what the, what it, in, in general, what it's gonna look like, the new Cosmo app. All right, so. Here is again why not working shoulder to shoulder with engineers at your manufacturing site sometimes isn't always the best thing. I call this one the Mary Kay. I mean, I'm aging myself, but the Mary Kay uh, Cosmo with this color. You can see the color is wrong. We sent the correct Pantone, and something that should have taken three minutes to correct took you know three days or a week to get right. So we've corrected this, but again, and I wanna show another example of the issues we run into whenever you're trying to do everything over 
cameras. We're doing everything over Zoom. It's an issue uh, for sure. But we fixed it. But I just kind of wanted, I'm keeping this as for sentimental reasons. But uh, you can see how the coloring, is, <laughs> it's, it's all wrong. Um, we have blocks that are done. So we have, everyone's been asking for replacement blocks. We have replacement blocks now. We are not doing the pre-order. Moving forward, pre-order is going to be a dirty word at Digital Dream Labs. We're going to have it ready for you to order, and there will be a certain amount of time it will take for you to receive your order. We're over this whole pre-order hump. I'm not doing it anymore. I think everybody will be really be here that. So we have these cubes. Once we validate that they're ready, that they're programmed, they will be up on our website for you to order. These will work with the old Cosmos. Uh, they'll be they'll be with that programming. So if you've lost one or lost a couple, you can order one, two, or three individually. You can order all three at once if you want to. It's up to you. We'll also have vector ones. But these are done. Finally, I had this. I had that thing on uh, Facebook that I posted a long time ago talking about the logo and all that stuff. They are complete and long last. So we're going to be uh, putting those live eventually, and we can start uh, completing those as well. Um, so that's that's kind of Cosmo on the manufacturing side. Uh, Cosmo is a little trickier because we've had to resize some of the boards. But yeah, you can see where we're, we're testing. So Cosmo is behind where Vector is Vector, uh, remarkably, because you have the Qualcomm chip, because you have so many other components that are similar to like a, a Samsung device, much easier to get uh, components off the pre-market. So Cosmo was a little bit trickier because of its Kingston chip and, and, and due to the other components of the boards. So it is behind Vector, but again, we are catching up. Uh, places that we're slowing down and we're catching up because we've moved everything in house versus the endless back and forth that we're having and communication issues. So that's accelerating our progress as well. And again, not sure on a date, but we are moving ASAP and we know we're late and everyone's focused on getting this done. Right. Thanks, Shape. Well, I think we're still looking for those screenshots and attendees. Uh, if, if we're not able to share those with you during the webinar, uh, our team will uh, be able to post those to social media uh, here in the coming days. Uh, well, just, and the app's gonna the app's coming up pretty soon too. So it, you know, uh, it's not a big deal. I just thought it'd be nice for them to get a sneak peek. Yeah. No. And so let's. Uh, I, I think we do have a couple questions uh, for Cosmo Cosmo 2.0. Uh, first question I want to ask is the attendee asks, you know, how how, how does Cosmo 2.0 and Vector 2.0 differ? And I think uh, that the, the, the externals are obviously very similar now, which you know is going to allow us to interchange parts. Uh, but how, how did the the robots and their capabilities differ? Yeah, so I, I'll handle that because we, we put a lot of thought into this. Uh, so Vector is still going to maintain more of its AI component, more of like a pet, if you will, more of its pet-like or member of the family-like um, components. And then uh, I would say Cosmo is going to be more, still more toy-like, and there will be a price differential once 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 we get all these uh, all the supplies streamlined. Once we get the cost of goods streamlined and all that stuff, you're going to see a much bigger price differential as the products evolve. I would say that Vector, if I could use an analogy, the way I think about personality and fitting inside of the universe is Vector would be more like Yoda and Cosmo is going to be more like Luke Skywalker, if I had to use an analogy. So that's how I see them fitting together and interacting. They will be able to recognize each other. The facial recognition that uh, Robbie's talking about has object recognition as well. And we'll have those objects, uh, their, their bodies and their eyes and their, their head, which as we know are very distinctive. They will have all of that programmed in there. So they'll be able to tell each other it's part of a family. So again, this family concept from, and, and, and the experience is maintained. The, the experience that people love so much about Cosmo, that feeling and that, that sense of a connectedness and having like control with your, with your phone or connected device can be very, it's gonna be identical. And then the feeling that you get where um, the cat like behavior with Vector knocking stuff off the, uh, desk or what have you is also going to be. So 
that's really key for us. There was you know this possibility where hey, let's just go with Factor, but I thought no, no, no. We need we need Cosmo as well because Cosmo is so important to this entire universe of robotics. So that's those are the major distinctions between the two. At least in my mind, that's that's how I think about it. Oh, great. And then I, I think, and Jacob, since since you uh, did show one of those replacements cubes, I had a couple of attendees ask about uh, the cubes for Cosmo and Vector, and whether they would be available for purchase separately from the robots. Uh, oh, yeah. Throw, throw yeah, 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 yeah. So there, so you, so you will be able to buy, you know, cube number one, cube number two, cube number three, or one and two two and three or all three together completely separate from the robot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that I made sure that we are able to do that. And so, same thing with vector. Like you'll be able to buy the vector cube separately from the robot. You don't have to buy that. You don't have to buy the vector to get the to get the cubes. These and this is something we're gonna have going forward in the future that we'll have extra cubes you can buy if you need to replace it. Um, yeah, that's for sure. That's that's something we wanted to do to make certain that people who are a plastic cube or something like that can replace it easily. And those, we'll, we're, uh, we'll, we'll announce that uh, in the coming weeks when you can actually go online to buy. But And it will be to buy. The shipping will be six to eight weeks, but it, they're, they're being made, it's done, and they will be shipping. Great. And then I think the, the last question that I, I've seen come across for Cosmo, and this relates to Vector as well, is, uh, the, the attendee asked, uh, can you replace Vector 1.0 batteries at all? I think mine might start be starting to be able to go or might be starting to go. And so that is one thing that we're looking at offering through the repair center. Yes, those batteries can be replaced, but they should be replaced by a qualified technician, correct? Yes, so my, my suggestion, and so we had uh, Matthew Mallet come in and kind of act as a consultant because he's done a lot of these robot repairs. So we have people here internally trained up to start doing that. We're going to start. We're going to be able to start uh, taking on those orders. I, I don't. I, I would say in the next month or two. I want to make sure that we have everything put to bed with the manufacturing before we start taking on repairs. But it's a lengthy process to disassemble and reassemble back there. So my recommendation is, unless you really want to be careful. Uh, I would send it in to replace the battery. We could probably put even a better, longer lasting battery in it. Same thing with screens. We'll start replacing the screens as well. Uh, and Cosmos. We'll have some Cosmos that you, we'll be able to repair. So kind of similar process to the, the car repair center, but obviously a little bit more streamlined, a lot more technical. But that's another service we'll be offering here in, in the coming months. Great. And then one last question uh, for... Cosmo and Vector. Uh, we had an attendee ask about Cosmo and Friends and uh, the potential that more episodes were coming. Uh, where can fans of Cosmo and Vector see the latest episodes of Cosmo and Friends? Okay, so the, the production schedule, I guess, Matt, I don't want to talk about it too much because it has turned a little bit top secret. I that do is know that's definitely there's a state secret. So yeah. <laughs> so, but so hey, let's just say it's it's getting bigger, uh, faster. Uh, but we do have blooper reels, right? We can talk about that that we're going to release. So yes, I, I guess uh, I will answer my question. Uh, the where attendees could find or fans of Cosmo and Friends uh, can find new episodes is on the Cosmo and Friends YouTube channel right now. Uh, but yes, they do have a series of new episodes. Uh, I have seen uh, some uh, clips and I'm sure fans are going to be really excited about uh, Cosmo getting into some more adventures. Um, but yes, please check out the YouTube channel and stay tuned because as Jacob said, uh, there are definitely big plans in the works uh, for Cosmo and Friends. Yeah, and one thing I did get, I did get high level permission to share this. So I go check out Trilla Studios. If you can post a link, Bridget, that'd be fantastic. So Trilla Studios, they have Cosmo as part of their reel. Uh, so Trilla Studios, you may not know who they are, uh, but they're the ones shooting all the Marvel 
uh, since uh, Captain America Civil War. And they have been doing all those Marvel movies and, and several other movies. So it's just south of Georgia in a town called Fayetteville. I went there last week and we're putting a lot of exciting content together. It's really cute. Part of the Cosmo shorts is part of their reel that they're showing off to the community and, and, to, and to their backers. So Cosmo's going Hollywood for sure and in a big way. Um, but uh, that's that's all I'll say about that for now. All right, well, let's let's keep uh, that theme line going and uh, <laughs> yeah, Hollywood. and uh, let's let's talk <laughs> about some butter robot. <laughs> all right, where? Yeah, okay. I, why don't you talk about garbage brain? Who, who wants to talk about garbage brain? Because I'm afraid I'm going to go on too long. So. No, so yeah, I, I will mention uh, my discussion with with Brian, who uh, wasn't able to join us today, but. Uh, uh, Brian Gardner McRae, who was able to join us uh, for the last webinar, our uh, chief gaming officer, uh, he and his team have been doing some great work on continued development for Garbage Brain. And so as while some of the hardware manufacturing has been slowed, uh, that does not mean that you know, our software team has stopped. In fact, I think the experience uh, that customers can expect from the Butter Robot is just that much deeper and more robust. Uh, their team are working on adding uh, more emotions, animations, and the dialogue, uh, the, the library that the Butter Robot is going to be pulling from has significantly increased uh, since the Save Robotics webinar uh, several months ago. And so uh, just really excited uh, for everyone to get their hands on the butter robot and start to, you know, experience for themselves all the unique ways uh, this, this robot is going to interact with its environment and begin to glitch, right, Jacob? Yeah, so an analogy I would use here is remember Furbies and how creepy they became as they became more and more self-aware. Uh, this has a very AI-like component to it, which was very important. This is something Justin really stressed. He wanted it to almost give the appearance that it's haunted in a way. Uh, so it's going to be a very, very different experience from Cosmo Vector for sure. And I don't want to give any more away because it's, it's going to be cool. It's going to be cool for sure. It, 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 <laughs> he's making everybody laugh. Let's put it that way inside the office. Yeah, and, and we'll go ahead and I'll, I'll bring up the, uh, the the tracker graphic for uh, Butter Robot J. But I, I think you might have someone there that attendees would be more interested in seeing. Yeah, than me. Yes, there. Yes. I do have a special guest who was narrating. So here he is, this is the final mock-up. Now, what I wanna make clear is that manufacturing delays um, had nothing to do with Butter Robot. So it, it was essentially that Justin wanted more than what we showed him initially, a lot more. Uh, we're talking glossy surfaces, we're talking about more components, we're talking about bigger range of motion, more personality. I, so, so much more than we originally showed. So we went back to the drawing board and have fitted him out in an incredible detail, almost double the amount of molded parts that either Vector or Cosmo have. So the, the key thing was, is like, you know, if Justin's happy, we're happy. So we finally had this mock-up, this final mock-up that we believe everybody from the top on down, Warner Brothers, uh, to Adult Swim, to Justin, and then our team, that this is the vision. We have realized the vision. And it's very, very, uh, I would call it slick, iPad-like. And our other stuff was a little bit, I would say kitschy is the word I'd use to describe our, our first uh, initial prototype. So the tooling is 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 being open. So it, it, it is digital Dream Labs 100% fault that we're behind on this because we needed to make it better and have a deeper, richer experience that would make people happy with the Butter Robot and everything that we want. But that's that's where we stand on that. So the the elect we're sitting on all the electronics. I already purchased um, purchased 
all the components. We have everything to, from the electronic side. The butter robot's actually a lot, a lot uh, simpler. And with the manufacturing, oh, let me show the butter stick. They're just really quick. So he's going to come with a little butter stick and a butter tray, so that he can pick up the butter and bring it to you. That's going to be his base function. But there's going to be a lot more other, you know, a lot of other functions uh, with it. But um, so we have all that. We have all the components locked down. The electronics are locked down. Let's let's call it from from a strictly like a, a printed circuit board perspective. Butter robots a lot lot simpler compared to um, uh, Cosmo Vector. But from a gear and from a gearing perspective, he's a lot more complicated because there's a lot more joints. There's a lot more stuff going on. A lot more servos. So we've locked everything down. We're sitting on that inventory, and now we just need to do the tolling and get the finish. The finish is really important. When we first had the Butter Robot, it was more of a matted finish. It, we want um, Justin wants glossy. He wants a clean look, very Apple-like look to the to the product. So we have that now. There's a particular shine that each of these uh, tools has to have. We do family molding with the, with these parts. So. We're opening all that stuff up, and we're 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 going to catch up. But um, yeah, the butter robots. It believe me, the wait is going to be worth it because we put a lot of time and effort into getting this to realize the, the creator's vision. Great, and I think we do have a couple questions for uh, the butter robot, and and uh, since since we've mentioned that pre-orders have not begun to ship yet. Uh, and, and I believe this is common for Cosmo and Vector as well. One of the attendees has asked, uh, why does Shopify say that my pre-order has shipped? Yeah, that's that's something wrong that we had. We had a, the wrong tag at Shopify. We, did, we, did we correct that, Robbie? Did we do something to, to change that? So currently the, um, the e-commerce platform that we use um, so we primarily had performed uh, digital sales previously. Uh, like that was like 80 to 90% of our stuff besides the, the uh, education space with puzzles. And so um, with that, when we went into the pre-orders, that option was still enabled. It is still enabled to keep things very consistent so that when we need to um, you know, start shipping these, then we can uh, either change all of those orders on the back end or track them separately. Uh, but either way, people will receive uh, emails with their tracking numbers when there are specific orders shipped out. So we are going to have that notification go out to everyone. Um, we are still kind of working on the e-commerce platform side of this and choosing what we want to do, but we're working with our distribution partners to ensure that the, uh, the the options that we go with are correct. So right now the the robots are going to show fulfilled in your orders when um, when you go into digitaldreamlabs.com to take a look at that. However, we understand that that is erroneous and we're going to be working to uh, correct that and give you the correct notification when your specific order ships. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, yeah, I, think, I, I think. Yeah, and I want I want to add something to that. It, you know, I, I think due to the volume of sales that we experience and due to the amount of logistics involved, I want us to get away from Shopify because there's so many things that are hard coded there that you have to go in and toggle and switch. It drives our team crazy. Um, so we are eventually going to just get away from that system in general. And that's one of the things we get stuck with, with these, with these bogus updates and stuff like that. It's part of their system. And then we got to go in and wrench something out. So, that when, what Robbie's alluding to is I would like to eventually have our own e-commerce platform where it's plugged in EDI for fulfillment in various warehouses and things like that, and it's all streamlined. Because right now it's very clunky, and that's what you're seeing. Um, and we're, we're working on it, but it's, it's, it's going to be a process for sure. Yeah, there's um, there's some discussion in the team with looking at um, different backends for you know the website and that kind of thing. Those are going to be long term and long burn projects, um, but that is you know a really big part of streamlining the user experience and something that I definitely am passionate about and want to. Uh, I want to make sure. I mean, ultimately, my dream and my vision for this is that somebody is going to be able to go in, see their orders, see their subscriptions, see you know everything in one glance, and that's really kind of like what I'm. Uh, you know, what the team and I are driving toward with this. 
Great. And you know, I, I think we have a couple questions about uh, the the Mo app for, for the butter robot. And and Jacob, really beyond passing the butter, what what are, what are customers going to be able to expect from the butter robots? <laughs> and what are they going to be able to control through the, through the mobile app? <laughs> so so I don't want to, uh, again, they, they want this to be secret, a lot of the functionality. So let me just put it in three terms. There's going to be kind of like an auto mode, right? Where he's going to put it around very similar, very vector-like behavior. Where he's just going to uh, just, and just imagine, imagine vector on your kitchen table that can get butter if you feel like you're going to come in. So he's going to put it around, very basic function, grab butter, okay, bring it to you. That, let's say that's setting number one. Then there's going to be a couple other settings. There will be another one where you can app and control it. So now you have more of like a Cosmo-like experience, right? Where you're driving him around and maybe you're going to grab the butter manually or you're going to have him grab something else on the, the kitchen table, something like that. Pass coffee. I don't know. Then there is that, that uh, AI component that is going to be uh, troubling. <laughs> it's the word I'll use. There's going to be an AI component that's going to be very troubling. And that that one you're gonna have to discover on your own. I'm not sure how to respond to that, but <laughs> <laughs> let me let, let's you know maybe stay on the, the butter robots, uh, Cosmo and Vector. And we had an attendee uh, ask if Jacob, you could make a recommendation. Uh, for an educator who is teaching junior high and high school students, which robot would be right for their classroom? I know we've talked in the past about uh, Digital Dream Labs being able to serve customers at any point in their lifetime through Cosmo, Vector, Butter Robot, and our future off offerings. For a junior high or high school student, which robot is the right robot for them? And and also for the classroom setting. Yeah. Uh, okay. So if, if you're talking, uh, let's say early middle school, late elementary school, I would say Cosmo, go that go with Cosmo all the way because you can do the the Blockly, you can do the, the drag and drop code, and you can do all that stuff. And uh, I would say students can catch on really quick there. Then if you want a little bit more advanced experience. Vector will take you from just you know writing Python the whole way to embedded uh, Linux or, or or C right like you can do you can span the whole gamut and you can take that the whole way up to college right when you're doing your own hosting and you know putting your own stuff on there reloading your own firmware etc cetera, etc cetera. you know we yeah we with with the open source you can be able to do all kinds of things so I would say high school let's say early high school to early college, that's where Vector falls in, into place. Yes. Great, great. And, and one more question about uh, the, the butter robot before we move on. Uh, and and this, this comes from Chris. Chris says, silly question. Could you use a real stick of butter with the butter robot? Jacob, I think we've talked about making that food safe plastic uh, for the butter stick. Um, yeah, good. yeah, yeah. So, so there's this whole sort of food if FDA guidelines, right? Around having a toy around food products. And so you're gonna have to be, to comply with all those regulations, you're gonna have to put the butter in a tray, essentially on a tray, and he'll grab the tray. If you want him to physically grab the butter, I think he'll be able to do it. But like there is in the part of that Rick and Morty episode when he's angry at Rick and just shoves the butter, he, he has it, he has it vertical and he shoves it into the, the tray, kind of does like that. Probably you might be able to get away with that, but that's something you're gonna to have to do on your own, probably with a manual setting because we're going to have to keep it enclosed for it being on the shelf and being a consumer product you're going to put the butter inside a butter tray and then he can he can at least grab the tray and, and drag it to you exactly like the cartoon but in order to grab that stick of butter and like throw it at somebody or jam it down um you're going to have to probably use a different setting but that's not a silly question that's actually there's actually some there's you know, you run into all these regulations and you have to navigate it somehow in order 
for consumer safety and the various federal compliances. And that's, that's kind of how we're dealing with that. Excellent. Well, I think that's uh, all the questions we have for Butter Robot right now, but let's jump into Overdrive and the update for InfiniDrive, Jacob. Yes, yes. So, all right. So here's here's what we're doing, guys. And no, we have not forgotten about it, but we are moving very slow like mud on this. I mean, we know. We know we are. Uh, we're trying to prioritize the robots first and then deal with the overdrive um, relaunch later. So the existing overdrive app, um, the especially the, the people who have paid for the the the, the one where we did the classic version, let's call it. It's gotten to the point now where the app stores won't recognize any of the old coding, right? So we are stripping it all back down, starting over with a brand new app. And of course, the people who pay will get that brand new app once we're ready. That So that's being completely redesigned, rebranded, but also new storylines and new customers as well that we're adding to that. So that... So that's kind of work that's going slowly in the background, I'm saying. The InfiniDrive, so we have, the, it's, the capacitors are finished, the thing, the charging track underneath it is finished. We just have to have it go through safety testing at this point. Again, this is the same thing with the cubes, the cubes that we have. I, we are not doing pre-orders on InfiniDrive. You will just buy it. Um, we're not gonna do pre-orders. You can just simply go to the shop and then buy from our store and then you can play with it to your heart's content. There are a couple things that there are, there, so through, and I thank you so much for all of your feedback because I think we have made this racing experience so much more interesting. Many people were talking about like, they don't like holding the phone. They would just like to control the car directly. So what we're going to do is have a console that you'll have that you can use your thumbs and you can drive the car manually. You don't, you don't really even have to have a phone or an app to drive it. So that's going to be, and that'll get in the younger kids who are not necessarily like playing with phones yet, but very controller-like, right? Then you can flip, you'll be able to flip uh, the controller up and everyone's seen this, right? Where then you take your phone and put it on top of the controller. So now you can control it on your cell phone if you want to and have the same experience that you have and the control. Then to build on top of that, yet again, through the camera, you'll have an AR experience. Again, you can use, you'll probably want to use the controller underneath and use the AR features in the camera on top. So all of those are in the works, but it is a slow burn project. I'm talking, we're going to take, it's going to push into next year for sure, uh, for sure. Uh, the InfiniDrive, the extensions and the add-ons, not, not certain about the timing on that. It may be, maybe be before the end of the year, I don't know. But with this whole OverDrive relaunch and rebranding and redoing a lot of these, um, what we're experimenting with right now, it's going to be a very different experience, a lot deeper, richer experience. And then we're going to be able to build on to that, right? Then the universe will extend because once we've actually at, applied AR into the driving experience, it's going, to, it's going to keep building. But we're still doing we're still doing a lot of R&D on that stuff. And then, yeah, I want to mention the beta driver program. It's going to be very important to get more and more of your feedback so we can really enhance um, the current feel that you have and then for the future experience. So. That's what I have on overdrive. Unfortunately, don't really have anything to show at this point. Hey, we're still, we're still, uh, we're still doing R and D on it, and a live demo is just not prepped. It might, be, we might have a live demo in October on the next uh, update. I think, I think we'll, I'm going to commit to that. We're going to have a live demo with InfiniDrive in October. And I get lots of people perked up around. I just saw everyone on the heads up. So, so but we're going to commit to that. So. Let's see, you know, October 28th, I'm going to have a live demo of it. Great. And yeah, as you mentioned, Jacob, uh, the URL there at the bottom of the slide, uh, ddl.io slash beta driver. And that's that's where uh, we have a sign up form uh, for customers. Uh, our team will be following up at a later date uh, to request additional information as we try to identify uh, Customers who have, you know, specific cars or setups that would be 
uh, appropriate for uh, our continued testing. Uh, but yes, please go to that URL and uh, sign up today. And with that, I think we're going to bring Robbie back and you guys will have, have a few questions. And uh, everyone, I understand we're getting close to the top of the hour. Uh, but if you have any questions, uh, we are going to try to stay here until we've answered uh, probably not all of the questions, but uh, as many as, as we can. Uh, so I want to start uh, with, with uh, th this, this question. And uh, Robbie, this is really related to uh, going back to the, the Cosmo app and uh, this attendee asked that many people are purchasing original Cosmos and looking to download the app, but cannot find it. Uh, it appears that it may be available from the app store. Uh, can you share something with attendees uh, that might clarify what they could do today uh, to download the Cosmo app for Android? Absolutely. So right now the, um, the Cosmo app is, um, you're absolutely right. It, we are definitely working on getting it back onto Google Play, but uh, the rebranding and the large backend uh, changes were a major portion of um, you know of the the update that we needed to get out um, to resolve some some things with Google Play and make sure that we are um, adhering to uh, all of the um, you know all the expectations that they have. Now, uh, with that in terms of fixing uh, or, or using your Cosmo today, uh, the Amazon App Store still has the Cosmo application um, still up and we are working on a, um, you know, the update to the Cosmo app we considered, you know, it is um, basically, you know, for the most part ready. However, um, we chose not to self host that because there would be a specific concern with um, with how the update is loaded onto the phone. So for instance, and I'll give you an example, if we choose to host this app ourselves, um, and, and I, you know, uh, wrote an article that had the application downloadable from like a support page, then yeah, you could definitely download the app, but that would lead to, um, a little bit of inconvenience and maybe some confusion on, on, uh, you know, for some users later, if they didn't receive updates through that, because the updates are tied to the Google play store and we would need to effectively have you download it from Google play to make sure that you receive updates uh, in a timely manner without having to uninstall the app and then reinstall it from the Google Play Store. So again, just kind of balancing the user experience uh, versus the timing is kind of a delicate balance here. And since we are so close to releasing the app, um, I think it's in the best interest for the user experience to make sure that we, um, that we keep uh, Google Play, the, the Google Play Store or the Amazon App Store as the sole, um, as sole distribution points. Yeah, this is just to avoid confusion in the future. Yep, absolutely. I know it's I know it's frustrating that it's been done a couple of weeks, but it's gonna be worth it long term. All right, great. Then I wanna ask, uh, so we have a question from an attendee. Uh, they say, I ordered, a, I pre-ordered my new robot uh, after April 15th. Uh, can I still get the limited edition sticker pack. Now, Robbie, I know you and the customer service team are doing a lot of work to follow up with customers uh, who might not have received uh, those limited edition sticker packs. Uh, is there anything you can share with attendees uh, on that side? Absolutely. So um, we have quite a few extra sticker packs. And um, what we're first making sure of is that we uh, have delivered all the sticker packs to those who pre-ordered before April 15th. In some cases, there were, um, you know, addresses that had changed or, you know, returned envelopes that, that didn't get delivered properly. So we're firing those back out. We're making sure that everyone who's entitled to those uh, sticker packs has those. And then uh, any of the extra sticker packs, we may also distribute to those those um, two uh, pre-orders that came after April 15th um, in a first come first serve basis. So uh, by doing that, we're going to, you know, allow, um, you know, other people to kind of join in the fun of having those sticker packs. Um, and we're going to, um, you know, provide a great user experience there. But um, we also want to make sure that, you know, again, with that first come first serve mentality, we make sure that everyone uh, who pre-ordered prior to April 15th um, and is, is eligible for those sticker packs receives those first uh, before we send out that secondary round. 
Great. And I think, Jacob, this is a question uh, for InfiniDrive and I, I think specifically for the upgrade kit. Uh, will the upgrade kit work with the existing overdrive cards? Yes. So, uh, you know what? I, here's, here's what I'm, I, we do have one thing I can show that will answer that. Why don't you skip to the next question? I'm going to run over here. I'm going to pick up my camera and I'm going to go over to where our track is. And then I'll show at least a little bit about how this is going to get us one. I'd rather, sh again, show, not tell. So um, Great. going well, to the next so question, I, I'll, I'm going to move. Pitch a related question uh, to you, Robbie, while, while Jacob's doing that. And and that is uh, really does the InfiniDrive upgrades that we have coming, does that potentially make the need for battery replacement obsolete? That's a really good question. So I wouldn't say it would make it obsolete, especially if you want to have flexibility with your tracks. The InfiniDrive system is designed to drive the cars uh, for a good amount of time. However, the battery um, may, you know, uh, take a little bit uh, of that additional load and we prefer to have a fresh battery in for the best user experience. Not that it's going to be entirely impossible to use your cars without that uh, fresh battery, but again, it will just enhance the experience, especially if you have very, very long tracks. You know, some people uh, choose to make tracks out of four, five, six, seven, eight kits. Um, and those very long tracks may be uh, you know, may stretch the infinite drive system just a little bit to where having a battery. We'll, we'll find uh, it spoils eventually. But... I'm sorry. Sorry about that. I forgot to mute myself. Robbie, keep going. No worries. So, um, so we want to make sure that those people who have longer tracks have a good experience and uh, make sure that the infinite drive system covers them. And I think a, a, a fresh battery or at least battery that can charge to have, you know, to, to half would be a very good uh, way to go for making sure your experience is good, but it's not going to, I wouldn't say that's going to be required for shorter tracks. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Robbie. And if you want to go ahead and share my video now, I'm kind of ready. I think you can see it. And to follow up with that question, if you don't feel like having battery or battery repair, we have bypassed it. So this is, this is the supercapacitor inside and it's clipping. You can see that the clearance is still there, but the supercapacitor is clipping onto the bottom and it's going to, it's feeding directly into the motors. So you do not necessarily need to have a functional battery, although like Robbie's saying, it's like belt and suspenders. You probably want to have the belt and suspenders because then you're guaranteed that this is going to be going on forever. So with the clip on this supercapacitor, it's going to behave, you know, very similar to like any other, any other car. And you, here you could just, you could basically pop it off and pop it back on again. And it's, it's going to be flush, so it's, it's right in line with the chassis. There's not going to be any clearance issue. The weight's been figured out. It's perfectly symmetrical. It's extremely light, so there's no more drag. And it's, you're just going to be able to like clip it right back on. Boom. And then the track underneath, so underneath, the track, you're not going to see anything different. It'll be plugged into the wall, but it won't be anything different. And then you'll just play as, as you would normally. And you won't perceive any difference other than the fact that you're – car is going to be going on you know theoretically for infinity so that's that's basically that's basically how that works okay great guys well then let's let's go back we have a couple questions about vector and escape pod and so robbie uh one of the users uh is asking is it possible to set up multiple instances of escape pod on a single network Sorry, Robbie, I think you might have uh, muted yourself there. Thank you. All right. We had to have that moment and it had to be me. Got it. Okay. So um, that's a great question. So the escape pod is not designed to set up multiple instances on one network, uh, specifically because it uh, the robot calls escape pod local in an explicit manner um, to find the escape pod regardless of its IP address. Now, when we come into the escape pod, um, it is 
a situation where the escape pod is designed to handle multiple vectors at once. And so uh, if you actually look at our support knowledge base, and I'll throw the link out there to all the attendees, but if you look at our support knowledge base, I've written an article that, um, uh, that is about managing multiple vectors on one escape pod. And the escape pod, uh, we actually had some fun testing it when our developers were going through it. But um, the, the short answer is that with a Pi 4, um, an 8 gigabyte Pi 4, we, um, we believe that up to 19 vectors uh, can, can be reasonably supported. So uh, that at that point becomes a little bit of a limitation of the hardware, but we're talking about 99.9% .9 of users being covered under uh, that particular, you know, that, that amount of vectors. If you have 19 or more vectors, I would like to shake your hand, um, but I, I think most people have significantly less, uh, maybe, you know, might be dealing with up to two, three or four. I, you know, I personally have like four or five. So um, again, I'll shoot out that link, but I think with just a couple of basic changes that you can use with the escape pod, um, it'll, uh, it'll support pretty much as many vectors as you'd like it to. And you should only have to run one on your network at a time. Great, now I wanna stick with, with escape pod and, and Jacob, this is, I'm gonna direct this to you. Uh, you know, we valued escape pod at a hundred dollars. The question really is from the, this users, why are we giving it away with vector 2.0 pre-orders? Um, especially because we, we do have that lifetime, uh, license. Why have we developed escape pod and, and what's the, what's the value to the community? Um, oh man, the echoes bigger here than I thought. So, you know, I'm, I'm in the, uh, the tooling section. Is that echo really bad? Do you need me to move? Uh, we can hear you. Okay. <laughs> I just thought I'd show another aspect of, of our offices here. So quick answer is that it, it, I don't mind showing that rough video because that rough video really does a nice job. Um, maybe you can start teeing that up while we're, while we're answering other questions, but a lot of people want to do self-hosting, right? They, they want to do their own thing. They don't want to be dependent on us. You know, the, initially we designed the escape pod in case, you know, we went belly up for some reason, you know, digital dream was we didn't make it, you know, the, the scary part of, you know, the business and those days are well behind us now. Right. But still, I think a lot of people see a lot of value to doing their own hosting and, and having their own machine learning and, rolling back their own firmware or messing around with their firmware. I mean, we have 1500 hobbyists who just love messing around with it. So there's, there's this idea that we are expanding the platform that there's a lot of interest, I would say from community members and expanding it, expanding these features and doing localized hosting in order to contribute just to robotics in general. And I think that is a major uh, step forward for all kinds of ro consumer robots, not just ours, right? You where you can pick up the operating system and move it. So, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, very interesting capabilities there that I think a lot of hobbies really want to do, and that's and that's why we're including it in the escape pod, in the escape pod in future versions of Vector, because that's one thing that I don't think they uh, many. Um, Many uh, consumer robotic companies can can actually say. Digital Dream Labs is proud to introduce Escape Pod for Vector. Escape Pod allows Vector to function independently from the cloud server, while enabling the customization of voice commands and improving response times. Escape Pod also utilizes an algorithm called fuzzy matching to improve Vector's speech recognition. Fuzzy matching uses a word-based search query that selects the closest match when a precise match for a keyword cannot be identified. Setting up Escape Pod is quick and intuitive. The Escape Pod for Vector is designed to run on a Raspberry Pi. The software is then formatted to an SD card and booted up from the Pi. This allows Vector owners to store multiple firmware versions should they decide to revert to the previous version of the firmware or transition back to the cloud server for voice command services. Authenticate your license and complete the onboarding process. And within minutes, your Vector is activated, launching with all of the features that the cloud service delivers and more. Interact with Vector, tailored to your custom voice commands on a local, faster network 
This is the new escape pod for Vector by Digital Dream Labs. Okay, Jacob. And so I want to stick with escape pod. We have one, one other question uh, that, that came in during uh, the video. And it, it, the, the question is this, uh, for vectors using escape pod, do the robots retain the same functionality as uh, those that are running on Digital Dream Labs servers? Robbie, why don't you like? handle that one? Sounds good. Okay, so um, the short answer is yes, with some limitations. So the knowledge graph and weather functions are um, when they're on their when they're on the hosted server, they use uh, what are called API keys. Now these API keys, Digital Dream Labs actually pays for on your behalf um, to provide that kind of functionality within the robot. Because I mean, Digital Dream Labs, we personally can't. Um, you know, we we don't have a distribution uh, of of you know, 3000 weather stations monitoring certain cities, that kind of thing, right? So that is, you know, that's utilized via an outside service that also, you know, hooks into our, our server and provides you the information that you're looking for. Um, but again, that is a paid service that we pay for on, uh, on your behalf with a subscription to, uh, to Vector's uh, membership. The same thing goes for the knowledge graph. So with the escape pod, these two items are not available. We are exploring ways that you can more easily implement the uh, you know, API keys that you would pay for yourself um, through these. And a lot of services even have free uh, API keys um, you know, under a certain you know, account of, of times that you might ask these questions per day. So we're exploring um, you know, updates to the escape pod that will allow you to more easily put in uh, your own API keys to this. Now, currently there is a way to you know, put in your own API keys, and this is through the Escape Pod extension. However, uh, that is currently a little bit more of a developer level tool, and we'd like to make it a little bit more accessible. So these are things that we may explore uh, with the Escape Pod moving forward. Great, and then uh, kind of keeping me on Escape Pod again, uh, does Escape Pod simply act as an intermediary between Vector and the cloud servers, or does it replace the need for those servers? It replaces the need entirely. So that's a good question. Um, one thing that the escape pod is really good for is um, unparalleled security and privacy. If um, you are one of those people who chooses uh, to limit your exposure to uh, outside hosted services for um, the reasons of security or privacy, um, it is a situation to where the escape pod, um, so, Vector actually, and I actually have an escape pod running uh, right here. It's kind of off camera, but it's right here on my desk. And basically Vector sends these, uh, these uh, voice queries directly to the escape pod. The escape pod runs two engines. One is a voice to text engine. And then the second engine is a text to intent engine. And then the intent is sent back from the escape pod to the vector. All of this happens over your local network and no data is sent outside with exception to diagnostic data or crashes for vector if you enable those uh, diagnostic data to be sent uh, through the onboarding process. And there is a checkbox for that. So, uh, but everything else stays completely on your network. We receive uh, no information about uh, your uh, voice queries or anything to that effect. Now we do have very secure and robust uh, practices for the voice queries that do come into our server. And I'd be glad to wax poetic on that all day. Um, but the short answer is that there's absolutely, the escape pod does not serve as an intermediary. It is an entire self-hosted system of its own that reaches out nowhere else. All right, great. Thanks, Robbie. Absolutely. Jacob, we, we have a question uh, about InfiniDrive and uh, one of the attendees would like to know if we have plans on re-releasing any of the existing OverDrive cars uh, or if uh, those those cars, I'm sorry, have, have cars been sent in for new batteries or make new cars with the new batteries? So uh, I think there's two questions here and I apologize. Do we plan on re-releasing the existing cars? And second, uh, what what services are we currently offering uh, for the uh, for customers with existing cars? Okay, um, great question. So I have kept all the trademarks and copyrights active on all the cars because I think they're cool. I think uh, Skull, 
I mean, you name it, you go through uh, these various designs and bodies. I think they're great. So we are keeping all the old cars. Um, and, and because there's simply there, there's still demand out there. Ironically, Infinite Drive, or let's just call it overdrive in general, is the simplest. You can get the chassis off the shelf. You can get the wheels off the shelf. The printed circuit board is the easiest. And to cut a mold for just the skin, which is what goes on top, is, is relatively inexpensive and actually very fast. So the... And I, so maintain, we're going to maintain those brands. We're going to maintain those trademarks. And we've, I've already done that. I filed the paperwork time and time again. So we have another you know, 16 years or something like that on those trademarks and copyrights. So that's done. And I'm going to do it because I think it's cool. So that for sure we're keeping. We, the, the licensing deal for Fast and Furious has rolled off. We don't have any plans to renew that. So that's going to probably fall off. What? Well, we're still going to maintain the functionality and things like that of those cars. But as far as like actually seeing images of those movie stars and various other images that are copy owned by Universal and, and their licensing team, we, we won't be renewing that. Um, so we will have a whole batch of new cars as well, though. We will have all kinds of skins. I've done a number of surveys uh, on our Facebook page where we have a very good idea of, you know, cars that you see. Um, just in general, various licensing things we could do, everything from, you know, Volkswagen to a James Bond car. I mean, you know, we've, we've, we've taken a look at all of that stuff. So that, that, that part of the business is, is relatively straightforward. We're doing repairs of mostly like the, the two biggest things we see at the repair center are, so, you know, number one, the batteries uh, messed up or just dead. And then there's just stuff stuck in the axle of your wheels. Um, a lot of time that, make, that makes people think there's a software or a firmware issue or it's buggy. The biggest thing I would say, if you're having an issue, take a look at the axle and make sure dog hair or just human hair hasn't wrapped around it. You can save yourself a lot of hassle if you just take some tweezers and go in there and poke around. You might not even see it, some fuzz or something like that. Those are the two top things. We just end up doing, giving it a, um, it's called a, a car wash. You know, it's a glorified car wash sometimes when, uh, in addition to replacing the battery, disassembling and replacing the battery. Um, I would highly recommend all people, if you're experiencing issues, do that first, because a lot of times that's simply, that's that's the answer. Uh, but we replace the batteries and other things. And occasionally there's some, there's like a gear ratio problem. One of the motors is burned out. Those are pretty rare, uh, but, but that we we can pretty much, we, we know these cars really well by now, pretty much do anything, except if the circuit board's totally fried. If the circuit board was fried, then then it's not probably going to work. Uh, but outside of that, which which is you know like less than half of one percent, uh, we can deal with most issues and repair most cars. Okay, great. We have a, a question, and, and Robbie, this this might be a great question uh, for you to answer. Uh, one of the attendees would like to know, uh, learn how to program vector. And I think they're, they're looking for advice on where they should start. Wow, that is a broad question. Um, it's a good question, but a broad one. So what I would probably start with is um, if you are interested in getting uh, you know, uh, into programming vector, then I would start with the Python SDK. The Python SDK is completely free and it's something that we offer as kind of an initial uh, starting point to, um, you know, getting to program vector, uh, you know, get them, you can uh, play all the animations, you can make them say things. Um, there was one actually the really, really cool use of the Python SDK where um, someone, um, I believe his name was Colin. He he actually uh, tied Vector to his Tesla car, and, and I think it would uh, his script would would have Vector like provide the status of the the Tesla's battery and this kind of stuff. That was actually a really really cool. So I recommend getting started with the SDK, um, and then. If you would like to dive in further, or if you ever encounter the limitations of the SDK, then at that point, I would go ahead and dive into uh, the open source kit for robots or OSCAR. Um, OSCAR is a pretty in-depth uh, 
product where we actually unlock your vector. You can access him via a terminal and change tons of things um, with the vector. I actually just put up some new examples onto oscar.ddl.io in terms of what you can actually do uh, with vector with Oscar um, and some of these uh, additional assets that we've released. So I'll throw in a link over to uh, you know those new examples and new repositories uh, in the chat here for the webinar. Thanks for asking. All right, great. And I think we've got time for a couple more questions. I have seen a few questions come in just asking uh, where the best source would be for pre-order updates. And so our team has been sending email updates uh, to, to customers uh, who've pre-ordered robots throughout the, um, since the, the pre-order campaigns ended. Uh, I'd recommend if you are not receiving those email updates uh, that you contact support at digitaldreamlabs.com and a member of our customer service team will make sure you get added to those lists. Uh, but we will try to share news as and when it is available. Uh, I don't think we want to inundate people with, with weekly email updates, but uh, we will make sure that you know the status of your pre-ordered robot and that you're aware of uh, you know, when, when those robots are beginning to ship from our factory. And with that, I think we maybe have a couple questions uh left bear with me one second guys while i scroll through thank everyone uh, i want to thank everyone for uh attending today and all of your attention we appreciate all these questions um and this is uh, perhaps where uh, we might end here but uh i have a question uh from an attendee about i think it's the cosmo and vector pre-order uh that they're referring to but they ask are the pre-order models going to be the same as the mass pro models? And so I know as people were looking at that tracker graphic, uh, we're showing uh, two different uh, two different production cycles uh, for these robots. Jacob, is there going to be any difference between those robots? No, no, there's there's no difference. One of the things I wanted to make clear and the reason why I wanted to point that out on the tracker is that you as a pre-order person are being prioritized over everybody else. So the the mass production units are going to be identical, but we are running a initial run to get to, to basically to take care of all the pre-order people first. So that way when something the one the one thing I don't want to have happen is that we go on Amazon, we start selling on Amazon, and there's a person who pre-ordered it who doesn't have their vector yet. So this is intentionally prioritizing uh, the pre-order people above mass production for retail that's going to be coming out to honor and respect the commitment and faith they have shown in us and to make certain that they're happy and that they have bragging rights and all that good stuff months before you could go into a store and purchase one. So that is absolutely critical. That's why I split those production runs. And I think in the long term, it's 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 going to be it's going to be good uh, for the most. I mean, the, for most of the pre-order people. But the it just in general, I want to make certain that the people who who have believed in us from the beginning are getting the best treatment possible. And then, you know, if you want to go pick one up at the store, which there are plenty of people who want to do that, they want to say like, look, I want to touch it and feel it and play with it. Then you, know, you can go to the store and buy it. But those who have taken the leap with us and then stick it out through thick and thin, they deserve prioritization. So that's the, that's the reason why those production runs are split. And I think the other thing that's great to re reiterate uh, for anybody who might've forgotten, you know, there were other perks, especially for Vector, um, for participating in the pre-order campaign, um, you know, the, the lifetime subscription. Obviously, we're going to be including Escape Pod uh, with all of the robots uh, being prioritized, a, a you know, reduction in the price. Um, you know, I, I just, just want to reiterate, you know, th those things. And I think that's, Jacob, why we have seen so few uh, refund requests uh, since the, the campaign uh, ended. 
Well, yeah, and our track record too, right? Like all the all the Kickstarter people, we 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 performed and delivered on that, and we're continuing to to raise the bar there. So there's no, you know, there's there's no reason we wouldn't wouldn't do the same. So yeah, there's a lot of faith and trust in us, and I appreciate that. It means a lot to me personally because we're all pouring our heart and soul into all this. Uh, because Vector does have a soul, uh, Cosmo does have a soul, in my opinion, and they, they're the future of robotics. And it's more than just, you know, quote unquote, toys we're making here, where we're contributing to, I, I believe, the advancement of humanity. So the, um, yeah, the, the, just, yeah, just, just the importance of our mission, I think, is, is paramount. Yes, by, by pre-ordering, you have plenty of perks and things like that. But I think the the stickiness, the, the the power, the potency we have is just the the love of these robots and what they contribute to people just across the globe. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Jacob. Very well said, uh, Jacob, Robbie. Uh, again, appreciate your guys' time today, and thank you to all the attendees for uh, joining us for today's State of Robotics uh, webinar. I uh, appreciate all the questions. Uh, I. Apologize if we weren't able to get to your specific question, uh, please feel free to reach out to us on social media and or at our uh, support team at support at digitaldreamlabs.com if there's anything we can do to be of assistance. Uh, gentlemen, thanks and have a great day. Great, thanks guys. Thank you, Matt, appreciate it. Thanks, Jacob, take care. Yep, thanks, bye.